Hello, how are we on this lovely sunny day? Ha, ah, sun! Amazing. It's blue skies and some clouds. It's, uh, it's a nice day. And uh, how are you? It's, uh, it's a year since... Uh, since COVID caused uh, a lockdown in the UK and uh, we did the minute silence yesterday it's uh, it's amazing how many how many lives have been touched by uh, by this COVID outbreak and maybe it'll It'll make some people think about their um, their mortality. So, hello, how are you? And uh, today we are we are going to carry on with Genesis, and uh, we are looking at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob today. Only one more, and then we'll be finished with Genesis. Way, and uh, and we'll be on to the Book of Exodus then. Uh, and I'm just gonna work my way through the the Bible. Um, it's uh, until until we get to uh, the prophets. Um, and uh, I've done all all of the prophets. Uh, I've done Job and and uh, the twelve minor prophets and and all all of Isaiah and what have you. So it's the the first section of the Bible that we've gone through. Anyway, on to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is a. Uh, twofold uh, thread running through the Old Testament. The Old Testament claims that uh, the God of the Jews is the God of the whole universe. Um, and in those days, uh, every nation had its own God. Um, so religion was strictly national. Um, and therefore, all wars were religious wars between one god and another god so religious wars aren't something new they've always been so yahweh was considered the national god of israel but israel herself claimed that her god was um above all gods and besides that her god was the only real god um and uh they they were convinced that Yahweh was um was the only real god which exists which was quite defensive well not quite defensive very offensive to um to the other nations um, and basically they said that other gods were uh, figments of human imagination. And they went even further and said it's, it's our God who not only made but maintains the entire universe. Um, and this would have been extremely offensive to other nations. Um, and you find these claims in... Isaiah 40, in Job, and in the Psalms. The God of, of the universe had chosen them, and them alone, to be his chosen people. Uh, this is a very personal choice. The God of the universe had become the God of the Jews. In fact, the God of the whole universe aligned himself not with one people initially, but with one family, a grand, grandfather, father and son. 
and the God of the entire universe was now calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Uh, it's in, an incredible claim and the other nations did not like it one little bit. Um, and this is all explained in, in the beginning of Genesis. And without Genesis, you would not have any grounds for this claim. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why Genesis is such an important book. Because all the groundwork and all, all, the, um, all the, uh, foundations for the whole of, uh, Jewish society and, uh, our belief in God are all founded in Genesis. So here we have the God of the whole universe aligning himself with three men. Now remember that uh, Genesis covers more time than the whole of the rest of the Bible put together. And you may not have even thought of that. But uh, from Exodus to the last book, Revelation, covers about 1500 years. Whereas Genesis covers the beginning of mankind through to Joseph and in in its in in its entirety which is far longer a time um potentially thousands and thousands of years um when you read the bible you realize that time has been terribly condensed uh, especially in Genesis, but in in all sorts of books, when when you read, uh, for example, Mark, um, it seems that Jesus was doing this, doing that, doing the other, um, and and they were straight after each other, one thing after another. Whereas that's not true. That that period of time was over three years, and he did other, uh, other stuff, um, no doubt, but it it leads you into this, um, a, a sort of a trap, um, not not a meaningful trap, but it, it, it's, it's we in our heads getting in, in, into our heads that this is... Um, you had Adam and Eve, and 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 then you had Cain and Abel, and then you had Noah, and and they were all really close together, and and after Noah you had um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the time expanse in between these people was immense, and when you look into Genesis, it's a very strange proportion of time uh, given to each section. The outline of Genesis goes like this. Uh, 1 to 11 uh, is a short section of the book. It's only a quarter of, of the book. But it covers a very long period of time. It covers centuries. And it covers many people, many nations. Twelve Chapters 12 to 50. Sorry about yawning. I don't know why. Um... covers long sec uh, it, it's it's a long section of the book so, so it's three quarters of the book and it only covers a short period as in a, a, a few years um, and it covers a few pa few people essentially one family and only four generations of that family there's a huge disproportion um here if it claims to be the history of the world and yet it's quite deliberate so there's a kind of slowing down of history in in the book of genesis there's a, a zooming in from the whole world we we basically see the whole universe being created to the whole world to one family 
Um, and this is very deliberate because we are looking at the history of from God's perspective, from God's point of view. Um, God began by dealing with everything and everyone and then he focused in on this one family. They were part of a very special line, the line of Seth, uh, of people who, who called on the name of the Lord. And people who called on the name of the Lord were more important to him than anyone else um, because they're the people whom he can fulfill his plans and his purposes through. So that's why we have such a strange proportion um, in, in Genesis. Now, verses 1 to 2 of Genesis, you have a God creator and a good creator. Uh, you have divine actions and human relationships. Um, verses three, or chapters three to eleven, you have bad creatures, the fall of man and the falling out of uh, man from the Garden of Eden. Verses twelve to thirty-six, uh, you have the God of Abraham versus Lot, and Isaac versus Ishmael, and Jacob versus Esau. And that's, that's the section that we're going to concentrate on today. And verse, uh, chapter 37 to 50, you have uh, the God of Joseph. Um, and he was... He was as far down as a prisoner and as far up as the premier of a country. The Bible isn't the answer to our problems. It's the answer to God's problem. And that may shock some of you. It may um, even astound some of you. But the Bible was written as um, the answer to God's problem. God's problem is what to do with a race that doesn't want to know him doesn't want to love him and doesn't want to obey him. One option was to wipe them all out, which he nearly did with Noah. But he kept Noah and Noah's family alive. And when they came out of the ark, almost immediately, Noah got drunk and exposed himself to his family. Um, or to his, to his two sons. Uh, and that was a uh, heinous crime at the time. And so it started all over again, this um, wickedness. Even Noah and his family, as such, didn't work. But God knew what he was going to do. With Abraham, he began his solution to his problem. God chose to send his son to be a Jew and ask the Jews to share him with everyone else. Um, and that's how he chose to save the whole world. Why did he create us? He had one son already and he enjoyed that son so much. He wanted a bigger family. Essentially, that's the reason why we are here. The tragedy is, he finished up saying, I wish I'd never had these children. With Abraham, he began his solution to his problem. Uh, what to do with the rebellious human race. And he chose to do it through uh, one particular part of the human race. Why did he choose the Jews? It's called the scandal of particularity. It's a, a, an, an offence to us 
uh, that he chose to solve his problem through the Jews. He should have chosen us. And he could have chosen any, any race through time and space, but he chose the Jews. William Norman Ewer, uh, who died in 1976, wrote this poem. How odd of God to choose the Jews. And then a number of years later, along came Cecil Brown. And he added another verse to this poem. But not so odd as those who choose a Jewish God but spurn the Jews. And that's so accurate. There are so many Christians who won't have anything to do with the Jews and who are actually anti-Semitic, uh, which is a peculiar thing. Jesus is and was a Jew. So how can we ridicule and... and, and decry the Jews it doesn't make sense to me and those two verses sum up the scandal of particularity he has sent his son to the Jews and he said now you share him with everybody else but that didn't quite work because as such the Jewish nation wouldn't even take Jesus into themselves Hi, Andrea. Um, and it's God's choice. And that's how he chose to save us. And that's why he's calling himself the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. In chapter 12 to 50, uh, you've got the story of just four men. Three are similar. And one is quite different. Um, he said he was the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. But he never said he was the God of Joseph. And we have to ask ourselves why. Um, and we'll come to that probably next time. The three, Abraham, Isaac and jo Joseph have a counterpoint or a contrast between them as men and one of their relatives. Abraham has his nephew Lot. Isaac has his stepbrother Ishmael. And Joseph has his twin Esau. And you notice the relationship is getting closer from nephew to stepbrother to twin. God is showing there we, are, we still have two lines running through the human race in stark contrast to each other. And the stories invite you to line yourself up with one side or the other, either Abraham's side or Lot's side, either Isaac's side or Ishmael's side, either um, Jacob's side or Esau's side. So... Essentially, who is your kind? Now, there are arguments that uh, these are only sagas or folk tales with a nucleus of truth, but basically made up stories. That these are simply legends and they have grown up around these men. We used to fiction uh, in today, uh, today's writing. And um, in our day, there are lots of fiction books. But in those days, it was just not done. They, they wrote stories based on facts. And initially, the, the stories were handed down from person to person, from tribe to tribe, from son, father to son. And... Um, they wrote them down and they wrote down what happened. They didn't stretch their imagination. The novel of fiction was completely unknown to them. Fiction is just simply not a format of writing in that day. And this comes down to us putting ourselves 
in the shoes of the people of that time and not putting our values and our traditions of today on the people of yesterday. We have to keep in mind and bear in mind these are people, well, at, at that time, thousands upon thousands of years ago and at based a couple of thousand miles away from us. And even, even the traditions of Wales are different to the traditions of England, which are different to the traditions of Scotland and Ireland. So how can we purport to put the traditions of Wales onto the traditions of um, a Jewish people based thousands of years ago it just doesn't happen and and we have to realize that and get our mindset straight um in 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 reading these books one of the things that tells us these stories are true is um there are no miracles in them if people were going to invent stories about the men of god they would have attached all sorts of miracles and all sorts of fantastical uh, episodes. And we have to remember who was writing this. This was Moses writing this, who was meticulous in putting down facts. Like he was meticulous in Numbers and meticulous in Leviticus and meticulous in Deuteronomy at putting the facts down. The cultural facts that emerge in these stories, um, the architectural facts in these stories have been proven to be too archaeological, not architectural. I, I can't even read my own right then. Um, the archaeological um, facts in these stories have been proven to be true uh, to the day in which they lived. The only thing that comes into play here which is uh, strange to the average reader, are angels. And they can't be explained by nature. But they come into play uh, right throughout the Bible. But if you've got problems with angels, then essentially you've got problems with the whole Bible. Apart from that, these stories are very ordinary. They're about people who've fall in love, live their lives and die. They disagree, they quarrel, they fight. So what's new? They build or erect tents, they build altars and worship God. All of this is within the range of normal human experience. So what's different about these stories? The answer is that God talks directly to them. And they talk back to him. Uh, the God of the entire universe makes a friend called Abraham. Imagine having that on your gravestone. Here lies Abraham, a friend of God. It was God that called him his friend. The God that flung the stars into the sky calls one man his friend. This is the scandal of particularity. People cannot handle God making personal friends. And yet that is the truth of what happens here. The thing to note is why should God identify himself with them? What's so special about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? And that's the question that has been pondered for thousands of years. What's so special about the Jews? What's so special about these particular men? The answer lies in God's sovereign choice. These three men had no natural claim on God. In each generation, God chooses the youngest, not the oldest son. They had no call on God. 
he chose them. Hi, Phil. In those days, the eldest son inherited the family business and all the finance. So the eldest son had a natural claim on his father's wealth and his father's everything. And in each generation, God chooses the youngest. He chooses Isaac, not Ishmael. He chooses Jacob, not Esau. God's telling us that nobody has a natural claim on him or his love. It's his love and he'll give it freely to you. And none of these three men had a moral claim on God. Not one of these three men could claim to be better than anybody else. The Bible is an honest book if it's nothing else. And it tells us that all three of these men were liars. We are given a picture of very, very ordinary men, just like us, who had their weaknesses. They were all liars. Both Abraham and Isaac lied through their teeth about their own wives to save their own skins. And Jacob was the worst of the lot. Jacob cheated his own twin uh, out of his inheritance and and got cheated in return. It's, it's one of the, the best and most humorous lines in the Bible. And lo, in the morning, it was Leah. You can just imagine he's waking up. He's just had knockies with his wife. He looks over, expecting Rachel to be there, and it's Leah. And he has to do a double take. He's like, what have I done? Because he'd have gone into the tent. His wife was veiled all the time. She'd have taken her veil off in the dark. They'd have had knockies in the dark. He'd have gone to sleep. And he wakes up to find out that it's Leah. He'd married the wrong sister. Da -da -da -da. Um, the lesson behind this is very profound. What a man sows, he will also reap. And Joseph, uh, Jacob, had sown deception and lies most of his life. And it had come back to bite him. He was cheated. Uh, he cheated his own blind father. And now somebody was cheating him. They were all very ordinary men. And ordinary failures. What did they have then? That God chose them. All of them were bigamists or polygamists. But there is one thing these men had. They had faith. These men believed in God. And God could do wonders when a man believes. God would rather have a believing man rather than a good man. God even said to Abraham that his faith went down in God's book as righteousness. Jesus was once asked, what do I need to do? And the answer was to believe on the one he sent. Faith is the beginning of a good life. You may do, you may do many good things, but if you're not a believer in God, where does it leave you? They all had that faith. They showed it in very, very different ways, but they all had that faith. They were very different people with different personalities and different temperaments. But the one common theme that links Abraham, Isaac and Jacob was their faith. Abraham showed it when he left the comfort of a comfy fireplace to live in a tent at the age of 75. He lived in a place called Ur. And they were incredibly advanced 
for their age. Knowing that he'd never see his home again. His home was a proper home. A home sort of like we'd have. And God wanted him to go into the mountains and live in a tent. And he took his whole family with him. Yay! But they stopped in Hebron, which was about halfway, and said, enough's enough, we're not going on alone. Oh. So Abraham stayed there. No, he didn't. Abraham went on with his lot, with his nephew Lot. He went on to where God was leading him. And if that old man had not done what he did, we wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here watching me and I wouldn't be here talking to you. God said to him, I want you to come with me to a land you've never seen and you'll never see this land again. And Abraham picked up his bed, so to speak, and walked. That's faith. Abraham was told by God he'd have a child by Sarah. And he waited 11 years and she said, take my servant. And he had Ishmael. But he had him by flesh and not by faith. God didn't put Ishmael down, but he didn't choose him either. He's the father of the Arab nations. So he blessed him all the same. Ishmael didn't show faith, but he was blessed. But he wasn't chosen by God. Sarah roared with laughter when Abraham told her that she was going to give uh, birth to a child. She was in her 80s. And Abraham and, and Sarah had to wait another 16 years after the birth of Ishmael. And then she had her son Isaac. And <laughs> Isaac in Hebrew is the word for laugh or joke. Then God asked Abraham to sacrifice him, sacrifice his only son. And Abraham went to do it. Again, that's a showing of faith. Abraham was willing to kill Isaac as a sacrifice because Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead after he had killed him. God had never done this before. So that again is a show of faith. He was willing to believe this because Abraham and Sarah conceived Isaac. When the Bible puts it, Abraham's body was as good as dead. So they were years and years and years past childbearing age. But Abraham and Sarah still conceived. And his rationale, I suppose, was if God can do that, he can do anything. Hi, Anthony. We see pictures of Abraham with a small teenage boy when he's taking him up to, um, up to, to, to kill him. But Isaac, in reality, was probably in his early 30s. Because the very next thing that we see in the Bible is Sarah's death at the age of 127. And Isaac, at this, this point, was 37. Besides this, Isaac had to carry the firewood uh, to the altar. And a little boy of 12 wouldn't be able to carry that amount of firewood. He submitted to his father on the mountain called Moriah, which in itself is an act of faith. And that mountain, which was once called Moriah, was later called Golgotha. Isaac also had faith. Faith 
that God would choose him a wife. And he accepted the wife that God chose for him. And that his, his wife's name was Rebecca. Jacob at first had faith in himself to manipulate the blessing. Jacob cheated his way to his father's blessing. At least it showed someone who wanted to be blessed. But he cheated his way there. But God had to break that man and he limped for the rest of his life. Uh, if, if you remember, uh, Jacob wrestled with God uh, all through the night and God put his hip out of place. After wrestling with God, he limped for the rest of his life. But from then on, he really believed in God and he believed that his 12 boys would become 12 tribes. These men, despite their failures as, and despite their misgivings, they shined as men of God. They had a faith and a faith that was unswerving and unrelenting. As a comparison, their relatives are men of flesh rather than of faith. You find materialists uh, rather than spiritual visionaries. Lot, who chose deliberately to go down into the fertile Jordan, uh, Jordan Valley, rather than live in the barren hills. Abraham and Lot's family had had a disagreement and they said they'd better live in se separate areas. Um, so Abraham said to Lot, you can take the first pick of the land. And Lot took what he saw as, saw as best for himself. Lot went after what his flesh saw. Lot, Ishmael and Esau all chose to live in the fertile land. They relied on their earthly eyes and went for that rather than consulting God. Esau would rather have a plate of instant food than wait for his blessing from his father. Esau wanted everything. And that attitude is still around now. People want everything and they want everything now. The book of Hebrews tells us not to be like Esau. He later regretted his bargain with tears. But there was no repentance there. So we have these three men of faith can contrasted with three men of the flesh. Abraham with Lot. Uh, Isaac with Ishmael and Jacob with Esau. That is the way of most families. Some have faith. And some rely on the flesh. These traits are also to be found in their wives. Sarah, Rachel and Rebecca were all very beautiful. Not glamorous, but beautiful. <laughs> I want it all, Billy. <laughs> yes. Um, not the Billy wants it all. That's a Queen song. Um They were all very beautiful, not glamorous. Glamour fades, but beauty increases. They all had the lasting beauty of lasting character. <coughs> and they all submitted to their husbands. The wives of the others are again a contrast to the wives of the three men of faith. Lot's wife did not submit. She looked back to what she was leaving, even knowing that God was about to judge the place. She wanted to see it for, for herself one last time, and she paid for that. Well, that's what we are looking for in these characters, in these chapters. <clears throat> Faith 
and flesh and the contrast between the two. And you begin to understand why God said, I belong on the side of faith. God made a covenant, a promise with Abraham on which we still rely today. God began creation with one man and he began redemption with one man. <coughs> God made a covenant with Abraham. It was not a contract, it was a covenant. It's not a bargain struck between two parties of equal power and authority. A covenant is entirely made by one party to bless the other party. You'll have to excuse me. I'll, I'm going to go and grab my drink. Because otherwise I'll end up not being able to speak. I don't have any trousers on, so what? Blanket. <laughs> That'll teach me. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> My voice is still croaky. <clears throat> so God made, made a covenant with Abraham, which was not a contract. It's not a, a bargain. A contract is a bargain struck by two parties, e equal in power. Um, now, <laughs> now we know where, where, where your son gets it from. I know. Uh, I sit here on Zoom, just in my underpants, <laughs> mainly. Um, that's a terrifying thought. Sorry. Um, a contract is is um, a, a bargain struck between two parties of equal power and authority. A covenant is entirely made by one party to bless the other party. And the other party has only two choices, whether to accept it or reject it, but they cannot change it. God makes a covenant and he keeps it. And God swears by this covenant. Um, people swear by a power higher than themselves. But God swears by himself. There is no power higher than himself. And God effectively marries himself to a family. Abraham's family. And the key words in all of this is I will. And when you read uh, chapter 12 of Genesis, God says six times I will. And he gave them a little piece of land where the, the roads of the earth cross, and that land was Jerusalem. Where the road of Africa crosses to Asia, and Arabia crosses to Europe. And they cross near a little hill called Armageddon. The centre of the land mass of the world is where this place is. And where it meets. God effectively gave them the title deeds to the place called Jerusalem. Another thing God promised was there would always be a descendant of Abraham on the earth. And the last thing that God promised was that he would use them to bless or curse every other nation. That's the calling of the Jews, to share God with everyone. Those who curse you will be cursed, and those who bless you will be blessed. And that, that is still the truth. 
Uh, in return, God expected that every male would be circumcised to show that they belong to that faith and that covenant. Do you know that God said that the children were to be circumcised on the eighth day? And recently it's been discovered that on or around the seventh day, a baby's blood starts co coagulating by itself. So if God had said to do that any earlier, the babies would have bled out. But God knew about children's blood and he said it's okay to do it from the eighth day, but not before. Purely because I think a baby's blood will clot from that point onwards. Abraham was to do everything that God told him to do. On the basis of that covenant, God said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And that phrase, I, you will, I will be your God and you will be my people, is repeated throughout the Bible until the very last page. I will be your their God and they will be my people. God wants to stick with us. God wants to stick with us through thin, thick and thin. Right to the end, God moves out of heaven and comes down to live with us on earth. He wants to be our family. And that was the whole purpose in creation. And creating us and our universe. Ishmael's descendants are still around today. And they still hate the Jews and the Christians and they are, uh, the Arab nation. Um, the last Edomites, Esau's people, have become extinct. And they la their last line was known as the Herods. It was a descendant of Esau that was the king of the Jews when Jesus was born. And who killed all the babies in Bethlehem to try and get rid of this descendant of Jacob that was coming to dethrone him, who was born to be king. Each of them left something that they did not possess to their sons in their will. The whole land. Again, what faith. All they possessed was in reality was one cave, a family vault in Hebron, but still they left the whole land to their descendants. But they believed that God had given it to them, so they left it in their wills, because one day the whole land would be theirs. In Hebrew 11 it says, all of them were still living by faith when they died. They never saw the promise, promises fulfilled, but still they lived by faith. And then it says this. They were all commanded, commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised to them. God had planned something better for us. that only together with us would they be made, made perfect. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, he's the God of the living. They are amongst the cloud of witnesses who are watching us and how we run our race. We will all come into it together. All those weaknesses taken away to perfectly reflect the image of God. They didn't believe from day to day. They didn't believe for a day. They didn't believe for a year. They didn't believe for 10 years. They lived by faith until they died. And that is very important because Jesus says that's the way that we should live. And Paul says that's the way that we should live. 
Paul says, I've run the race. He's talking about consistency. And the whole Bible says that this is the way that we should live. It's not just a matter of getting a ticket into heaven. It's about living a life of faith until we die. Amen. Thanks very much. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, if you've got any questions, put your questions in the comments section below. And uh, I'll see you next time for the end of Genesis, the story of Joseph. God bless.